Good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? I am Makeda Valletta, and I am live on my page, Makeda Valletta Travels, my Instagram page. I will save and repost it to my YouTube. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with me, I am a Harlemite who currently lives in Chicago, I'm an Afro American. I travel um, both nationally and internationally. And I'm a dancer. I'm a serious student of dances of the African diaspora, particularly in the Americas. And some of you have, what's up? What's up? What's up, Mode 9? Um, and I'm, 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 yeah, I'm a serious dancer. And I have been studying Haitian uh, folkloric dance since 2006. So that's 18 years now. Um, and I've, you know, also immersed myself in Afro-Brazilian, Afro-Cuban, Afro-Puerto Rican, um, Afro-Colombian, various dances from the diaspora, which has taught me a lot of history about um, history of the Americas, okay, because we have an interlinked history. And so my introduction into Haitian culture, anything Haitian, was the dancing, right, because I grew up in New York City. I didn't grow up around Haitians. Um, I grew up around Dominicans. I grew up around Puerto Ricans, um, Jews, um, you know, maybe some other English speaking Caribbeans like Jamaicans, Trinidadians, a little bit of Trini Americans and Jamaicans. That was um, what I grew up around in upper Manhattan. Um, it wasn't until I was grown that I started, that Haitians started becoming a part of my world. And let me just say that I have deep love for Haitian people, right? Um, but the things, my, my, you know, when I started learning the, the Haitian folklore, which there's so much medicine and so much history in those, in those dances and those rhythms, when I started to learn that, it was like I was seeing the opposite, you know, within the Haitians that I would meet outside of that world. Now, let me explain what I mean. Okay. So I have, um, and I also went to Haiti in 2010, right after the earthquake. So, there's a bunch of, of things I want to say. Um, and so I, I wrote notes. So I'm going to try to stick to my notes so I can get to all my points and make it make sense. Okay. Um, so I went to Haiti with a dance teacher. Um, I told you I was studying Haitian dance. I went with my, with my, uh, the first teacher that I had, and I still study with him to this day. He's in New York city. Um, we went in 2010. Okay. Um, two months, it was March. It was March, March 2010. It, it was two months after the earthquake. Now, I have videos where I talk about why Haitian dance is my medicine, okay? I talk about why black dance is so important to me and uh, why, especially in the Americas, but Haiti, you know, is very deep with the medicine and the, the medicine in their dances. And I've been talking about this for years. I have a few videos where I talk about this on my other YouTube page, the Renaissance Amazon, and I will try to post links below. Um, and when I first got into it, okay, what I started to notice was that whenever I, it, even up until this day, when I meet Haitians, they never know anything about their folklore, okay? they When I say that I study Haitian dance, they think I'm talking about compa. Compa is a social dance. That's not what I'm talking about. Nobody, whether they're on the island or off the island, seems to be aware of the rich folkloric dances. You know, they seem to all um, run away from knowing any anything associated with voodoo was negative. And even when I went to Haiti, I had never seen white Jesus so much in my life. So it was like a people who were so black and so proud to be black. Like when Haiti and Jamaica are two countries I went to outside of Africa where I felt like I was in Africa because it was everybody was dark skin and looked the same way. I'm not going to say there's not light skin Haitians or there's not Haitians that are even non-black Haitians. There are. But when I went to Haiti and we went all over the island, all I saw was dark skin black people everywhere. Same thing with Jamaica. Okay. Those are like probably the two most African countries in the Americas, even more so than Brazil. Yes. Brazil has a lot of Africans, but percentage wise, it's not as much as Haiti in, in um, uh, um, uh, Jamaica. Um, same thing with Cuba. But I remember being shocked when I went there and I just saw white Jesus on everything. And I remember when I went to Haiti in 2010, that's when Obama was president in the U.S. And I remember one of the first things that came to my mind was, I, I said, I remember saying this to myself, I said, I'm not an expert on the history of Haiti, 
But this looks like what happens when whoever is in charge doesn't care. Like to me, it was clear that whoever had been in charge of Haiti did not care. And I'm not just talking about outside influences. Okay. I'm talking about your own people. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm not always about blaming outside forces because at the end of the day, we've all been colonized, right? Everybody's been colonized. Why is it that some people who are colonized can get their stuff together and overcome and others can't? You know, um, and, and to me, I feel like it's the corruption. The corruption in Haiti is extremely deep. And I remember when I went there, it was hard to be there. I mean, when we first got off the plane, we were greeted with the most beautiful music and musicians. And I learned a lot. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to get too deep into this in this, this conversation because I have other videos where I speak about the, the, the medicine and the dances, right? Which I have met so many Haitian Americans who are so proud to be Haitian, right? Especially in Miami. It's interesting how close Miami is to Haiti, but so many Haitians in Miami don't even go to Haiti or have never been to Haiti. I've come across so many Haitians in Miami that have never been to Haiti and it's right there. You know, the Haitians in New York definitely go back and forth. But they'll be so proud to be Haitian, but then they're not there, right? Or they've never been there. Or I remember when I went in 2010, there a lot of Haitians on the Internet who were saying, Haiti doesn't need you and troops. Haiti doesn't need outside people and intervention. I remember them saying that in 2010. When we went there, we all took two suitcases, right, to give of stuff to give away to people. And we we're with, you know, okay, first of all, let me go back. First of all, when we got off the plane, First, we were greeted with the most beautiful uh, music and a very welcome, a welcome that touched your heart. Then, we, you know, we go get our, our suitcases, which is complete chaos, okay? Complete chaos to get your suitcase. Then we had to have, you know, my teacher had people in his family that basically had to shield us when we, came, when we left the airport because there was a mob of kids who just storm you and they're all begging for money. Like, I've never seen anything like it. And we were put into a car, windows rolled up, and we were told, don't give them anything, right? There was a girl from New Orleans, a professor from New Orleans, who she had been to Haiti, it might have been her third time. And she could not help it, because they're like on the glass. I mean, moms of children. So she cracked the window and starts giving, um, you know, a little bit of, you know, coins or whatever money she was giving. But the problem with that is that if you would give something to two kids, you already got like a hundred kids around you. You give something to five of them, another hundred kids come, and then the kids uh, that were already there who didn't get anything, they start fighting. So it's like you 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 want to try to help, but when you try to help, you just create more chaos. Okay, and that's why I appreciated um, Anthony Bourdain because when Anthony Bourdain traveled around the world, he never ignored the the, the he never ignored the elephant in the room. OK. Um, and he talked about that because out of he's been, of course, more places than I have. But I've never been in any place where you had that many kids. I mean, not just at the airport. We 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 took van. We took a van and we would ride through the country. So we weren't just in Port-au-Prince. We went to many different parts of the island. And I remember it was so freaking hot. And I remember, you know, first of all, it was like impossible to find coconut water because I don't drink soda. OK. Uh, to be hydrated, coconut water and watermelon juice is like the best thing to drink. And I'm, I'm in the Caribbean and I'm like, is there a coconut, you know, like some coconut water, but everybody was selling soda. I never saw so much soda in my life is what I saw in Haiti. I saw paintings for soda on the sides of buildings. So like the, the, um, soda ads in Haiti were paintings on buildings, right? So every time we stopped someplace, there'd be a mob of kids that would be trying to sell the soda or begging for money. Um, and it was everywhere we went, you know, that was happening. OK. And of course, like a lot of poor countries, um, not all of them, but there's a lot of poor countries you go to when they realize that you're American. They want to start trying to get more money from you and upping the price. And so, the, of course, that was happening. Um, now, when we went to a tent city, because we all took two suitcases to um, give clothes and give things to people. So we went to one with my Haitian teacher and, you know, members of his family. And we started to try to hand out stuff, okay? I remember we gave a shirt. We would give a shirt to one person. Somebody else would come with a belt and start trying to beat that person for a shirt. So every time we gave something to somebody, it caused a fight. People would start attacking each other and fighting each other for the things that we were giving them. And I remember the UN troops just appeared behind us. I'll never forget. And I remember thinking, 
good thank goodness because i felt like we were about to get trampled okay trying to help and that was happening in haiti there were people who were delivering food who got murdered um and that was in 2010 okay so it was complete chaos and i remember thinking there's no infrastructure i remember having a conversation with another um, my roommate at the time was a japanese american woman and we were just talking about like the lack of infrastructure was astonishing and at the time that's when people were still using calling cards. And I remember I bought calling card um, in New York that had on the back of the calling card, it had all these different Caribbean island flags on it. So I just assumed, oh, this calling card will be, I can use it in Haiti. But when we were in Haiti, we were staying in a hotel and, you know, you would see phones, but none of the phones were real. They were just there for show. They didn't have any landlines anywhere. So you couldn't call anybody. And I remember being like shocked by that, right? So I just remember thinking, if you want to help Haitians, if you want to help Haiti, if you want to send things to Haiti, how are they distributing it? Because there's no infrastructure and it was complete chaos. Another thing I remember was riding um, through the country and looking at people and seeing if people weren't working, they were sitting around just staring into space. And I remember thinking to myself, one of the things that, Haiti needs and that, you know, that if somebody wants to help Haiti, one of the things is they need books. They need more literacy. They need people to come and teach them how to read. Okay. I remember thinking that now going to Cuba, you know, Cuba is an example of a country that is poor, that is very organized. Okay. Very educated. Okay. Um, Cubans have a, a literacy rate that's higher than America. Okay. Um, and there's books everywhere, okay? In Cuba, you, there's books everywhere. And the books are not about bullshit. They're all um, scholarly texts, okay? Scholarly texts. They are very knowledgeable and, and worldly. And there's just, yeah, there's books everywhere. Haiti was the exact opposite. Haiti and Cuba both have very strong folklore, okay? When it comes to their dances, their music, they have very strong, um, very... Like when you talk about Afro-Cuban dance or Afro-Haitian dance, there's like hundreds of things that go under that umbrella. There's several different Afro-Cuban dance forms and rhythms. There's several different Afro-Haitian dance forms and rhythms. However, Cubans know about it, okay? Castro made it. Castro made it so that it was a part of their educational system, all right? So it doesn't matter if you clean toilets in, in, in Cuba. They know about their dances. They know about rumba. They know about the abuqa. They know about their Arisha dances. They're doing them out in public for everybody to see okay they know about all those things they know about the dances they know about the rhythms they know about the history haitians do not when we were in haiti you know we went to a dance school called it's not just a dance school it's an art school in haiti called in arts okay most of the dancers painters uh go to that school and let me tell you that haiti has some of the to me they have the most beautiful art in the caribbean okay when it comes to paintings they have the most be you can always recognize a haitian painting they have the most beautiful art in the caribbean and i know other people that will co-sign on that very profound. I could do a whole video on the things that I've learned from that. But it's interesting because when I talk to my Haitian friends about it, they're just totally clueless. The only people, and I remember when I first started studying Haitian dance, my dad said to me, most of the Haitians are not like, most Haitians are not like the people that you're around. And I didn't understand that at the time, right? And that was because the Haitians in the dance and drum world, they're a sheer minority. Because outside of that dance and drum world, nobody knows. And I'm, I've always tried to get Haitians to go to Haitian dance classes. I'm like, you have all these white people in here. You have all these other uh, um, black people from other places, everybody but you guys. Like you don't see the value in your own dances and you're running so much and trying so hard to be Catholic and to ignore um, you know, your folklore. And anything, anything associated with voodoo is like a deep shame. And I've been around Haitian Americans whose parents are adamantly against them knowing anything about it. I've been around Haitian Americans who would ask me questions, okay, I'm not Haitian. But they would ask me questions because they, they, it seems like Haitians are all tuned in. That to me, they're very special people. They're all, they can like see things. They are very tuned in, but a lot of them are disconnected and don't know what to do with it because of the fact that their families are so, um, against it, right? So the thing, and then, okay, so with the earthquake, you know, and, uh, so I remember it was like seven billion dollars that was sent to Haiti. And I remember at the time I was dancing for a Haitian folklore company in New York. 
Um, Mirka Lean's Haitian Dance Company. She's a, 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 a female teacher in New York. So I've, I've studied with various Haitian dance teachers, okay? I went to Haiti with a male teacher, Peniel Guerrier, who I still study with to this day. He's the most amazing dance teacher that I've ever studied with out of any dance style, okay? And I feel very strongly about the Haitian drumming and dancing and the medicine in it, okay? And then um, the, uh, there was a woman who I was dancing for with, right? And I remember, um, which I'm gonna call it, we did a fundraiser for Haiti, okay? So after the earthquake had happened, my teacher, she had a sister that was trapped under a house in Haiti and she was alive. But my teacher knew that her sister was gonna die because she was in a part of Haiti that people weren't really helping. You know, they were telling me, my, my teacher was telling me about older people in her family that was getting robbed by gangs and robbed by people. So you have this, you know, you have this terrible earthquake that killed like 300,000 people. And yet still, you know, you had other Haitians going around robbing people, just like with Hurricane Katrina. OK, as terrible as Hurricane Katrina was, there was a bunch of New Orleans dudes raping chicks in the Superdome. Like as besides the fact that rape is just wrong, period. OK, New Orleans is deathly hot, sticky and funky in the summertime. OK. And then you have these people in the Superdome, people haven't taken baths, all kinds of funky and nasty and just like, and you're raping chicks and everybody, everybody's going through this traumatic situation. Like you can't blame colonizers for that. Okay. You cannot blame the colonizers or white people because you choose to go rape your people and rob your people in a time of crisis. I'm sorry. Okay. That's number one. So people can miss me with that excuse. Okay. It's just like, you know, I'm from Harlem. You know, growing up in the 80s and 90s during the crack era, and people can say, oh, the government put crack in the hoods, the government put guns in the hoods. Okay, that didn't mean that you had to pick it up and sell it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, me and my twin brother grew up around that. We never touched that. I never dated a drug dealer. I never thought that was cute. My brother never sold crack. It wasn't that. You didn't have to do it. Just because they drop it there doesn't mean that you have to do it. So if you choose to participate in the downfall of your own people, you're responsible for that, okay? The, the the crack dealers who terrorized Harlem and many other cities, okay, in the country, I don't blame white people for that because you can hear, like, for example, you hear Biggie talking about, oh, I had to sell crack to feed my daughter, okay? Well, the, the men who use that excuse, they far exceeded the amount of money they needed to take care of their family. You, you had so much money that you had the most expensive cars, the most expensive clothes, the most expensive jewelry, spending all this money to show off. So you did that at the detriment to your own people. You destroyed several families and communities. Crack dealers did. So I don't know what black America's obsession is with gangsters and why they think it's so cool and, oh, you're a drug dealer. Now, selling weed is one thing, but you're selling crack and getting people addicted, people's mothers, okay? There's nothing cool about that, okay? There's nothing that you can't blame other people for that, okay? I'm about holding people accountable, all right? So with Haiti, it's like, yes, Haiti has been exploited. Haiti has been, and, and, and we could talk about that all day. Um, even when it comes to food, when I was in my first graduate program, I remember learning um, that we were taking a class about international food systems, and they were saying, like, a lot of people didn't know that Haiti was producing cattle and beef for America. So you had parts of Haiti where people were starving, but they were producing um, cattle and beef to be shipped here. Okay. And so there's a lot of politics with, you know, international food systems, all of that. So I'm very much aware of it, but at the same time, okay. When I see Haitians speak, okay. So wait, my mind is in so many places. Let me say something else. I have a good friend, a Haitian photographer who I met in Harlem almost 20 years ago now. Okay. He moved back to Haiti maybe 10 years ago. Okay. Um, he's from Miami, right? But he moved to Haiti and he was living there with his family. And I saw him in 2021, 2021, I saw him in Miami. And in 2021, cause I was saying to him, oh, I'm thinking about going back to Haiti. Cause I hadn't been there since 2010. And I heard that it had changed and I'm telling him this. And he said, no, don't go now. It is not a good time. He said over the years, every time he came to Miami, he was always trying to convince Haitians to go to Haiti, because like I said, there's a whole lot of Haitians in Miami that have never been to Haiti, which is crazy because it's right there. Um, he said he was always telling Haitian people that they need to go to Haiti. 
And he said this is the first time he wasn't telling them that because he told me it's so bad. And he's the one who started telling me about how bad the gangs were, you know, that it was so terrible. He lived in a town that was like maybe um, an hour, hour and a half drive from Port-au-Prince. He said that he had to fly because it was so bad that you would get kidnapped and robbed trying to drive to Port-au-Prince. Okay, now this is 2021. And he decided to take his family and come back to Miami, even though he had been living in Haiti for years and he loved living there. He was like, it's way too dangerous. When the president was assassinated in 2021, my friend said to me, good, good riddance. He was happy that that president, he was said, he told me that president is the reason why the gangs were so bad. He won't stop the gangs and he's supporting the gangs. And so that's when I started really hearing about this in 2021. So when you look and you see that, okay, who killed the president of Haiti, right? Some people, did they ever find out? Some people say it's America. Some people say it's the prime minister who just stepped down because that prime minister, um, he had gotten sworn in or something a couple of weeks before the president of Haiti was assassinated in 2021. So that president was assassinated, then he took power. Some people think he was responsible for assassinating the president. Um, the president's wife is now being accused of being involved in his assassination. So the level of corruption is deep, okay? Every country, okay, every country has some level of corruption. We all know America has some corruption, but there's a levels to it. And I feel like the corruption that happens in African countries and the corruption that happens in Haiti, which is also a very African country, is disgusting, okay? It's a whole different level of corruption. So you have outside influences, okay, or, you know, but what, it, what happens when your own people can be bought so easily? Your own people don't care. Again, what I said, when I went to Haiti, that was the first thing that I thought. I'm like, people can say whatever they want about Obama. You have people in America complaining, black people complaining about Obama in 2010. But I don't care what anybody says. I think Obama genuinely cared. Whoever was in charge in Haiti, they didn't care. And that was totally obvious, okay? It's not just simply that, that the world has robbed them, okay? And with Cuba, the person who is responsible for, you know, people can say what they want about Castro. Again, everybody has their pros and cons. There's no, there's no leader in the world that somebody doesn't have criticisms of. There's not one. But with Castro, okay, um, the way that he, he kicked all the, 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 he kicked all the white, um, uh, criminals out. They are all in Miami, which is why Miami is like number one, uh, number one source of income in Miami is criminal activity. Okay. He, he, you know, you have all those racist white Cubans in Miami, which is one reason why I cannot stand Miami because I never experienced blatant racism until I went to Miami and started dealing with those white Cubans. Some reason the black people from Miami seem to be oblivious to it, but to me, it's extremely obvious. The white Cubans in Miami, I, I've been all through the South and never experienced what I experienced in the white Cubans in Miami, okay? And they're the exact difference. You know, they're completely different from the people who are actually still in Cuba, all right? Um, but Castro wasn't black. Castro wasn't African, okay? But Castro was for the black people. He ended segregation. He made it. He gave um, a lot of black people their land back. You know, he uh, made education important. And Cuba... Cuba has a very long life expectancy, okay? Um, Cuba has some of the richest soil. It's a very poor country, but people are acting civilized in Cuba, okay? Nothing like what's going on in Haiti. So, let me, okay, let me look at my notes, okay. <sighs> okay, I said all these things. So, my main question is, Okay, also, one thing I learned, you know, because I started to like, let me, let me look deeper into this history because you hear so many conflicting things, right? Um, Haiti was once the most profitable um, island in the Caribbean. It might have been the most profitable place in the Americas, period, because of what they're producing. And oh, before I go, yeah, okay, so yeah, they were one of the most profitable. And with the Haitian Revolution, Haitian voodoo was completely involved in that, okay? Studying the dances, studying the folkloric dances, there's a lot that you learn about the Haitian Revolution and, like, the real warrior spirit side of it, which, let me tell you, is not an African spirit that was responsible for the Haitian Revolution. It was um, an Arawak Taino, 
Arawak Taino spirits. Haitian voodoo has, I'm trying to see, do I have my book? No. Haitian voodoo has two families, okay? So it's very different than what you see in Cuba and Brazil. Like Cuba has, um, like the Yoruba tradition in Cuba has Aboqua, the Congo. Um, same thing with Brazil. Like, you know, there's one that's Yoruba, one that is Congo, one that, so that they have it divided by different, um, places in Africa. Whereas Haiti, ha Haitian voodoo, and those, and they're different systems, okay? The Aboqua, Palo, which is Congolese, um, Ifa, Yoruba, they're all from different lineages in Africa and they're different practices. Haitian voodoo has two families, okay? The, the Rara, I mean, sorry, um, Rada and Petuo, okay? Rada and Petuo. Petuo are the fire spirits that are responsible for the Haitian revolution. You have a Petuo drum. The very first drum I ever started playing was a Petuo drum, okay? Um, and then the Rada, the Rada family is considered to be more friendly spirits. Now, I remember being at a, a, a conference years ago with my teacher and a Haitian elder said, the Petuo spirits were not from Africa, okay? Those fiery warrior spirits were not from Africa. They were from that island, okay? Then there, the book um, Divine Horsemen by Maya Deren, The Living Gods of Haiti. The Living Gods of Haiti. It was written by a Jewish woman. But my Haitian friends who come from legendary Haitian families, drummer families, you know, voodoo families, they said, no, that book is the truth. It's accurate. You know, she was with my people. That book is completely accurate. And that book also talks about how those petrol spirits are not African spirits. OK, my dad's friend. Um, her name is why well, am I forgetting her name? Um, Katrina Hazard. OK, she's a black dance scholar in Philly, black American. She wrote the book. Um, um, Mojo working, okay. Mojo working is about the Afro-American hoodoo system, but she's like a dance. Uh, she's not an anthropologist. I want to say she, but she's kind of like that. Um, she's like a dance historian, sociologist, and she's initiated into certain African traditions. And she said to me that there were no warrior spirits. You know, she talked about also how Haiti, you know, the Haitian Revolution, those warrior spirits were not African, and they didn't have those warrior spirits in Africa, right? So again. There was always, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm all about people respect going to where it's due and people being held accountable. Okay. So when people always hear that Haitian voodoo is African is African, it's half African, half from that land. Okay. Half Taino Arawak. And the history that we were told was always that the indigenous people were so weak and they all got killed. And that's not true. Okay. This video is not about that, but that's not true. And Haitian voodoo is a clear example of that. Okay. So. I feel like a lot of Haitians now, they run from that and understanding, um, a lot of Africans do too, but I don't know that Africans have ever used, I, I don't study African dance like that, except the Congo. Okay. And there's a distinct difference between, uh, African dances and Afro derived dances in the Americas. Okay. For example, in Haitian, okay. So Haiti has a Rada and the Petwa. So it's not divided by, um, uh, it's not like in Cuba where you have a system that is just Yoruba or just Congo, right? In the Haitian folklore, you have a dance called Congo that dances from the, is linked to the Congo. You have a dance called Igbo. That dance is, of course, dealing with the Igbo tribe in Nigeria. And they call the Igbo tribe a warrior tribe. Now, I don't know if Igbo's from Nigeria because the Igbo's that I meet that are from Nigeria, they're all like very intelligent, you know, the engineers, you know, I don't, I've never had a conversation with them as to, do you consider your tribe a warrior tribe? I don't know how, but I know that this Igbo dance in Haiti is considered to be a warrior dance. And the story is over here is that they were a warrior tribe. And this whole dance is about breaking free of chains and fighting. Um, I've read that in, in North America, you had Igbos that got off the boat and they were chained and shackled at the, the, the wrist and the, and the, um, the wrist and the ankles and they just walked into the water and drowned themselves because they their belief was you're not going to enslave me i'll just get out this body and go back to my homeland okay and that was a warrior mind state okay so you you hear that story about the ebos but to my knowledge there's no ebo anything uh dances or derived stuff in cuba or brazil but haiti has an ebo okay um Haiti has, you know, the, the Haitian voodoo system, it's a mixture 
of African and indigenous stuff, okay? It's a mixture and it's totally, it's organized and very different than the rest of the Americas and it's very potent. Now, I'm not a voodoo practitioner, okay? But when you study these dances, there's a lot of things. I always, I always call it Haitian cosmology. There's a lot of wisdom and a lot of things that I have learned from it and I have the highest respect for Haitian cosmology, even when a lot of Haitians themselves don't. Um, and I've always had a great love for Haitian people, right? So this is coming with all the love, but at the same time, it's like you have so many Haitians that flee their country, okay? And then they'll be in America and they'll be saying, talking about Haiti doesn't need outside intervention. Haiti doesn't need this. Haiti, and they're, they're, they're speaking so strongly from outside of the country. But if all of your, you know, your finest are leaving, I mean, so many Haitians leaving, leaving. And then, then you have other Haitians. Like, I just, I just saw a video on Instagram, like, last week with this Haitian girl. And I ended up getting into argument with some people because this Haitian girl was, like, made this whole video talking about how her parents didn't come to America for a better life. And her life was so much better in Haiti. And she's going on and on and on. And she's telling people, if you never lived in Haiti, you can't comment on this. And she's going on about how wonderful her life wasn't, how wonderful her life was in Haiti. But to me, I'm thinking, if your life was so wonderful in Haiti, then why are you here? You know what I'm saying? Like, if your life was so much better in Haiti, and you're going to say that your parents didn't come to America for a better life, and you just had this wonderful life in Haiti, why are you here? Why are you not in Haiti? You know what I'm saying? So make that make sense. And let's be real, I've been to Haiti. And not just to Port-au-Prince. I was all over the island, and the whole island is a mess, okay? Yeah, there might be some places that's a little bit better than others, but I wouldn't want to live anywhere there, okay? It is a mess. And you have travel influencers who just in the past few months are showing Haiti, and it's like, oh, it's so beautiful, and it's calm, and the, the, the media is exaggerating. And you would see in the comments some Haitians would be saying that it was um, – not accurate reporting, okay? Because first of all, the beach that you would see people on was a, a tourist beach. Haitians themselves could not access that beach, okay? And for me, I'm the kind of traveler. When I travel, I don't do resorts, okay? And when I went to Jamaica, I didn't stay in a resort. I flew into Kingston, and I was with a Jamaican who had always been in Jamaica and had never left Jamaica, and I was with him for like a week, and he showed me various parishes on that side of the island. So, and I just went around with him, and I didn't say anything, and I observed. So I saw the real Jamaica. When you go to Jamaica and you go fly to a, uh, you're at a, a resort that's isolated and everybody there is just there to, to serve you. You're not immersed in the community at all. You know what I'm saying? To me, it's like, did you really go to that place? I don't travel that way, right? Um, but a lot of these resorts in Jamaica, the Jamaicans don't have access to the water, okay? Jamaicans, the people that live on that island cannot go to their own beach, okay? So you have a lot of that. So this beach that they were showing in Haiti, that's what people were saying. Like Haitians can't even access this beach. Now I look at, there's a Haitian girl on YouTube who she's saying, oh, it's exaggerated and it's not the whole island. So I asked my, my friend um, who, you know, was living there and had moved, to, moved his family back to Miami. And I said, well, some, because I asked him, what do you think about what's going on? What do you think about interventions? Because I see Haitians that are mad. They don't want, they don't want Kenyan troops coming. They don't want Americans helping. I see Haitians online that they don't want any outside intervention. They're like, oh, let Haiti, you know, um, let Haiti make its own choices and all this. We don't need inter outside intervention, which is the same thing I heard in 2010 when they said, we don't need UN troops. But there's the people on the internet saying that. I'm like, when I went to Haiti, I disagreed. Yeah, you did. Because, People were getting killed trying to help. And even right now in Haiti, there are pe even before this, ha this, this whole thing started happening a couple of weeks ago, this, this gang thing has been going on. And you can go on YouTube and you'll see people who are documenting a year ago, six months ago, whatever, like these gangs stopping trucks full of food. Who the tr They went to collect food from farmers to try to distribute to poor Haitian people who are starving. And the gangs were stopping them from going through. So you're contributing to starving your own people. Please, and, and as the daughter of somebody who was heavily involved in the civil rights movement, okay, my dad was on the front lines of the civil rights movement. My dad was a part of, he, my dad was one of the founding members of an organization called RAM, which is Revolutionary Action Movement, the group that strategically put the Black Panthers together, okay? And my dad wasn't, he was not a 
follower of, um, of Martin Luther King back then. Okay, my dad will be 83 this year or 82 or something like that. 82, he'll be 82 this year. So back then my dad was not, he was from Florida. He said Florida Negroes were all, all had guns and were ready, to sh were ready to shoot. They weren't cooperating with the nonviolent movement, okay? So my dad was not a supporter of King back then. He was a black radical. He was on some ready to die, even though his, his mentor, Queen Mother Moore, told him that it's not smart to be ready to die for it. No, okay? She gave him a lot of wisdom. Um, and my dad knew Malcolm X very well. He was at over 100 of his speeches, okay? Um, and he was supposed to be, you know, with him the day he was assassinated, which is five blocks from where I grew up in New York. So now as an older man, my dad looks back and he says, you know what? Martin was the, he's the one that did the real important work. Change happened because of him. People think, even, even Malcolm X used to talk smack about the Southern leaders acting like they're punks because they're doing this nonviolent movement. When my dad said, in reality, Martin Luther King and his people, they were heavily armed. They just didn't have it at their marches. And that was strategic. That was strategic so that, because the, they wanted the photos of us being attacked. Martin Luther King knew that if we fight back and they have photos of us fighting, they can change the narrative and lie. And they can say, oh, um, th these black people are fighting the whites and, and they're attacking them. But if you don't have any images of us fighting them, but you have all the images of them being vile, sicking dogs on us, water hoses, you know, doing these horrible things to us, and the world sees it, okay? That was his strategy. My mom, who was in high school at the time, or high school, junior high, I don't know. Uh, my mom was born in 1949. So my mom said when this came out in the papers, you know, when it, when she saw um, these photos from the South of black people being attacked in the streets, she was shocked. Okay, my mom is from Pennsylvania. She's from Western Pennsylvania, um, like 30 minutes outside of Pittsburgh, close to the border of Ohio. She said it was racist where she lived, but she, it wasn't segregated. Like she still went to school with white kids, even though there was still racism. And we know Pennsylvania has a lot of Klan. But my mom was shocked when she saw all these pictures. She said they didn't know that was happening in the South. They didn't know it was that bad. It was, it was Martin Luther King's strategy of getting that one in the papers for the world to see, for the North part of America to see. They had no idea what black people were going through in the American South. Maybe you knew in theory, but you didn't really know. I mean, look what happened to Emmett Till. I mean, he was in Chicago, which also has a long racist history, but it still ain't the South. And that's the thing that my dad said. My dad said, because my dad left the South at 20 and went North because he felt like he was either going to get killed or kill a cracker. And that was his thing. So he went to Philly. Then he was in Harlem. He didn't go back down South for like 25 years. But as a grown man, my dad said, no, he, the real brave people were the people who stayed in the South. The real brave people were the, the people who stayed in the South and kept that fight going. The, the, the person who really um, made change and was responsible for it was Martin Luther King. And that Malcolm X, you know, he talked about guns, but he didn't know how to shoot. He, the, that the, the NOI never raised any guns to the Klan, but Southern Christian preachers did. Okay. So again, let's get history accurate, accurate and give respect where it's due. Now, Malcolm X, before he died, he was very much an advocate of black people voting, everybody being registered to vote and voting. Okay. My mom, she's a union organizer, okay? So I, I have watched and understand the importance of organization, okay? When the Occupy Wall Street movement was happening, both of my parents said, oh, this is going to go nowhere because they have no objective. They're just in the street protesting. When you ask them, what's your objective? They're not meeting with, they refuse to meet with politicians. Both of my parents said, this is a waste of time. It's not going anywhere, and it didn't. They don't understand having, you know, being organized, having objectives, Working towards those objectives, like if you have to define those things, or else it's just it's just not going anywhere. So now you have a situation. Now, 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 people from the Caribbean and Africa or wherever can claim that we're coming to America or we're going to Europe because you know life is so unbearable in our country. Uh, people can say, let's use America as an example, okay? Because a lot of people love to blame America. America did this to us. America did that to us. Okay, yes. But that same American government, right, that might have exploited your country, they've also exploited black Americans. 
Do you know that black Americans, we've been robbed of our land. We've been robbed of our money. We've been robbed by bank. We've been exploited and robbed several times over on this land. But we didn't flee our country by the thousands and the millions. I'm not going to say there's no black Americans who moved to somewhere else, but we didn't flee in mass. That's why when you go to other countries, you don't see black American food restaurants, but you see everybody else's country, Jamaican, Haitian, uh, Ethiopian, whatever other country food you see all over the world. You don't, you can't, you can really only find our food in America because we don't flee our countries on that, on that level. So, this we we had we stayed and fought and it wasn't comfortable. Okay, the civil war in this country was the, the bloodiest war this country has ever seen. Okay, Ryan says, "How did Black America get robbed of land? White terrorism." Okay, my dad talks about this. I mean, there are other ways too. I mean, you have people right now, Gucci Gullah people, getting their land taken away from them in South Carolina, all kinds of sneak ways. But one of the one of the main ways that my dad would talk about is all the black people who left the South, okay, because of white terrorism and didn't look back. They didn't pay the taxes on the land. They didn't think they were ever going to go back to the South because they didn't think the South was ever going to change. So you have a lot of black Americans who let go of their land in the South, okay, and move North. Now, people move from South to North, they didn't leave the country. They still stayed in the country. You didn't see us jumping shit by the billions. Now, you have a lot of black people nowadays you know, a lot of black Americans who, 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 you know, they, they have had this, this idea, they have this, um, idea that if you're in an all black nation, right, if you're in an all black nation, it's less stressful and people treat you right because they look like me, uh, all this nonsense, okay, which is complete nonsense, okay, because some of those countries have the worst police and the worst corruption. Yeah, America has a police corruption issue, but I, I've been saying police brutality and corrupt police is not an American issue. It's a worldwide issue. And America doesn't have the worst of it. The police in other countries be way more corrupt. Deal with the police in Jamaica. I would rather deal with American police over Jamaican police any day. I'd rather be in American jail over Jamaican jail any day. Same thing with Nigeria, okay? Same thing, the police in Mexico look scary as hell, okay? So, and they're corrupt. They always want you to pay them even when you didn't do anything. You know what I'm saying? So the level, they don't care that you're black. This idea that we're black and united, that's a black American idea. The rest of the black world doesn't see it like that because everybody's black. You go to Jamaica, everybody's black. When I, went, when I landed in Jamaica, I felt like I was in Ghana. That was the first thing that came to my mind. And I went to Jamaica, this is like back in 2006. And so I just thought Ghana, I didn't even say Africa. Ghana came to my mind. Didn't come to find out. Most of the black people, most of the black people in Jamaica do come from Ghana, but that's what I, I thought, you know what I'm saying? Um, and Jamaica, I mean, Haiti and, and, and the only, and the only place that I experienced that was like as, as, as shocking to me as Haiti was Senegal. Only difference is that Senegal is safe. Okay. So Haiti is not safe. Senegal is safe, but and Senegal's infrastructure is a little better, you know what I'm saying? But both of them to me were just like too much for me to deal with, especially Haiti. All right. So when I see these, 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 you know, people who, you know, first of all, a lot of Haitians who don't live in Haiti, who have so much to say about what Haiti needs, but you're not there. Okay. Like, why are you not there helping your people? Why, and then you have Haitians that say, oh, it's not the whole country. So then why aren't you there? If it's not the whole country, if you're saying that you have a better life, you know, in Haiti, then why aren't you in Haiti? Why are so many Haitians fleeing? Your country, the country is not going to get better that way. You know, America didn't get better for black people and black people can still complain. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. But when you have blacks in America who say nothing has changed, that's some bullshit. The only people that will say nothing has changed are the people who come from people who never did shit. Okay. It takes generations. It takes decades to make real change. The fight continues. Most people are too lazy to organize and do anything like that. Most people are too lazy. People can talk all day, but have you done the work? I was raised by people who did the work and the work is not over. So instead of complaining about what past generations didn't do and how past generations failed you, what are you doing to continue the work? It's a constant battle. Okay. And when I see people that have so much to say, you know, so many Haitians who have fled the country and they, they're 
we don't need outside intervention. Well, I mean, you guys are showing that you can't handle it on your own. You keep saying Haitians don't need intervention, but you guys keep robbing each other. Okay? You guys keep robbing each other. Now, when I was looking at this documentary talking about the history of Haiti, they were saying that Haiti was, you know, it was the most fruitful, money producing uh, colony in the Americas. When they kicked the colonizers out, okay, there was a divide in the, in the thinking and the mindset, okay? You had some Haitians that felt like, okay, so when they thought, how do we move here, forward from here? You had some Haitians that said, well, we should just all get some land and, you know, basically mind our own business, all right? Just, you know, we grow our own food, we grow our own land, and we, you know, we, we get um, allocated stuff and we mind our own business, basically, and live life. But there were other Haitians that felt strongly that Haiti needed to go back to slavery, okay? These are black people on the island who believed that the, the, the country needed to go back to slavery to be productive, okay? And there's been this divide going on in Haiti ever since, people not being able to agree. Now, if you think about it, there's no country where everybody agrees. Everybody doesn't agree in America. We have staunchly different opinions, okay? And this is the reason why January 6th with, with, with Donald Trump is such a big deal. We can't have, how you have gangs take over your country, okay? Gangs, like, we can't have no shit like that. And then the problem, see, Americans feel very entitled to have guns, which I don't agree with. Um, but America is a gun-crazy country, okay, to the, the, the a place of craziness, okay? And America doesn't, just like... You know, Ghana can say, we don't care what the rest of the world thinks about our, our LGBT laws. Well, America doesn't care what the rest of the world thinks about us being gun crazy. A lot of Americans are freaking gun crazy, okay? New York is a different beast because we're not like that. But the, the idea that Americans feel like they can have the most, you know, powerful weapons, weapons that are more powerful than what the police have because just in case something happens. And then, see, the difference, though, the U.S. has a strong military. Okay, so at the end of the day, if, if the military wants you to stop, they'll drop a bomb on your ass. Okay, so we're not, we the people in America ain't going to get to no point where we're taking over the government and with our guns. But at the same time, you see, this is the, the, the problem with Haiti, though, is that these, gun, these gangs are heavily armed. They're more heavily armed than the police. Okay, they are terrorizing people. Okay, because I, I see some Haitians that are not in Haiti saying, oh, they're not gangs. They're not gangs. They're fighting for what's right. People in Haiti are calling them gangs, okay? And my friend, my Haitian friend, who, his name is Chris, I'm just going to call him Chris, since he's left Haiti, and I was talking to him, I said, you know, what do you feel? Like, there are Haitians that feel like there shouldn't be any outside intervention. He said, Haitians that feel like there shouldn't be any outside intervention don't live in the capital. That's what he said, okay? He said, they don't live in the capital. And I found that interesting because I've never lived in the capital, but I've been there. And I remember back then people saying that Haiti didn't need any intervention and they damn sure did. And most people I heard saying that on the internet, there were Haitians who were comfortable in America saying that. Okay. So if you are showing like, and you can't keep saying that they can't govern themselves because the U S is intervening and putting this person in power and that person, in power, they're still Haitians. As long as Haitians decide to be corrupt and rob their own people and da 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 da, you're participating in that. So you have these gangs who are raping women. The hospitals can't be open because they're afraid for their lives. Okay, so the doctors and nurses might come to a certain hospital for three hours in the morning and then they get out because it's dangerous for them. So if somebody gets shot or something, then oh, you have to go somewhere else or die. Okay, you have you know, Haitians contributing to starving their own people, stopping food trucks. And I remember when I was there in 2010, somebody, uh, uh, somebody driving a food truck was murdered. Driving a food truck. So the food doesn't get to the Haitian people who are starving. But you're saying that these aren't gangs, and you're saying that they're fighting for what's right. That makes no sense. How are you going to get organization out of chaos like that? There's, there, there, there's multiple, then, then, then they're freeing people out of prison. That's insane. Freeing prisoners, people are in prison for all different reasons, for raping, for killing. Imagine if you sent somebody to jail because they killed your child. And then 
now they have, they're free. And they might be looking for you because you got them locked up behind bars. Now they want revenge. So you have all kinds of people who live in Haiti who are now afraid for their safety because the jails got let out. There's nothing good that comes out of that. In no successful revolution that I know of did anybody start freeing the prisoners, okay? And having gangs with no organization and no, um, no objectives for real, okay? So you want the, you want the prime minister to step down. Who even before that prime minister got, before the president was assassinated, he had overstayed his term. He, and he wouldn't get out the office. Again, corruption. Corruption on corruption on corruption. He wouldn't get out of office. A lot of Haitians were mad about that. When he was assassinated, my friend Chris said, good, good riddance. He couldn't stand him. My friend Chris said that that man, the, 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 the Haitian president that was assassinated, was fueling the gangs and making them worse. Then, you know, this Ariel prime minister dude who had been sworn in two weeks before the president was assassinated, now he's leader. Now he keeps promising people that they're going to have elections, which I don't know how they can have elections because there's no infrastructure. Like, there's no addresses. Like, how are you going to have elections? I don't even, my mind can't comprehend that. And who's going to say that the elections aren't corrupt? To me, you need outside intervention to make sure that the elections aren't corrupt. But we also know that every country has an issue with corruption. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So what is the answer for real? Um, Ryan said, Haiti would never be forgiven for killing all those white slave masters, and they would never be forgiven for it in the white man's world. They were suffering for that. No, I don't believe that they're suffering because of that. <clears throat> because the white man and them has nothing to do with the fact that you choose to be corrupt. You choose to rob your own people. That you choose to go around the island terrorizing and killing people. Okay? That has, you can't blame the white man for that kind of ignorance. Okay? If you're saying you truly want, you know, liberation for your people, why are you, what, 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 where are the white people who are in Haiti right now terrorizing Haitians? Everybody's been colonized, okay? Who in the world hasn't been colonized? And hey, Cuba is cut off, okay? You, you don't see Cubans on the internet. You don't see Cubans really anywhere. You know, and it's like, they're not even really allowed to leave their country like that. And Cuba, I've been to Cuba five times. Okay, it's also very poor. But Castro makes sure that Cuban people have what they, you know, the Cubans first, which America doesn't do. America puts every other immigrant above Americans, okay? Um, and Cuba makes sure that they know how to read, okay? That they, they read books, that they're well educated, okay? And Cuba is not a mess like that. And Cuba is being starved. And they're not running around doing that to each other. So, and, and, and Ryan, to say they won't get aid, it's like, even if Haiti, Haiti gets aid, they, all they do is steal it. Haitians themselves. Even when Wyclef John raised all this money for the earthquake, they looked into this, this, he put together this organization to raise money, and they said he spent that money on flying his family around. That money never got back to Haiti, a Haitian, okay? There was $7 billion raised for Haiti during the earthquake, and people who saw all the Clintons and that, a lot of Haitians themselves be stealing and are corrupt. The white man has nothing to do with the fact that the Haitian president just refused to step down when he was supposed to, okay? And that th this Ariel guy is t saying for years, we're going to have an election, but we don't. Like, And th there's decades of that. You know, you have Papa Doc and his son and all of that, okay? So I'm not with always blaming, you know, somebody else. And that's all Haitians do. And I'm not saying that that France and America and stuff didn't do stuff to them, but you have to also take um, accountability for what you're doing to your, your, each other. And you're making it worse, okay? You're making it worse. Just like when Hurricane Katrina happened. Yes, okay? Kanye said George Bush doesn't care about white people. And that whole response wasn't good enough, okay? But starting with their own mayor, who was black, whose response wasn't good enough. But on top of that, you had New Orleans thugs terrorizing people, killing people, raping people, okay? So, no, people, and, 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 when, and when the earthquake happened in Haiti, I remember my teacher was telling me about elderly people in her family that was getting robbed by Haitians. Young Haitian men were going around and robbing old ladies. 
Okay? So, uh, some people, some people will say all black nations, you know, they, 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 they can't, um, run themselves efficiently and da, 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 da. And it's like, nobody wants to believe that. But I mean, when you look around at the examples, that's pretty much, pretty much what you see. And I, I'm just saying facts are facts. Because the level of corruption in African countries, like I, I have listened to so many, I've known so many Africans who told me over the years that their own family will scam them, that their own family scams them. I didn't know what they meant by that, but I've heard that. I've been on YouTube for the past week listening to several YouTube videos of people from various parts of Africa, but also other places in the world too, who talk about how their family be forcing them to send money back home. And, they're, and they're, 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 they might be sending money back home to build a house and they get back home 10 years from now and nobody ever built anything and the family just stole the money and then the family is mean to them. Or, you know, um, if the family, if, if they don't have the money, they'll be damn near, they'll be in Canada or America or Europe, damn near starving to death and can't afford to live, but they're sending all their money back home. And then when they can't do it, their family is, is, is saying horrible things to them and saying that they'll never be anything, just cursing their whole life. I've heard so many stories like that. And that's crazy to me. And they're all being scammed by their family. My ex, I have an ex 10 years ago. He was Nigerian and black American. His father, um, his father was from Nigeria, born and raised. And he fled Nigeria, came to America, married a black American woman, had three kids. But he said his dad always used to talk shit about black Americans, always. And But his father never went back to Nigeria. He fled Nigeria, never looked back, never went back. When his father was on his deathbed, okay, this is like 12 years ago now. When his father was on his deathbed, he said to my ex, don't talk to your family in Nigeria, they're all thieves, okay? He said that to his, his son. And my ex looked very Nigerian. When people saw him, they just thought, nobody thought he was American. They just like, you're Nigerian. But my ex didn't identify with being Nigerian because he had never been there. He had no connection to his family there. You know, his mom was American. He was born and raised here. And um, his dad said that, okay? Don't talk to anybody in your family because they're all thieves, okay? So when you're hearing, and, 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 and I, you know, was told, don't go to Nigeria by yourself. Everybody's going to try to scam you. So and people are scamming their own family members, okay? I've seen Africans who go to Africa and don't want to eat food that certain people in their family cook and they think they're going to poison them, all right? In America, that's not normal. That's not normal. I'm not going to say people don't scan their families, but that's not the norm, and that's not considered okay. And people would flip out over that, okay? So, I mean, so what, I mean, and, and I'm going to say in Africa, a lot of Africans, like, it's almost like they worship white people. Same thing with Jamaica. Ryan, you're Jamaican. I feel like a lot of Jamaicans worship white people. I feel like when people, light-skinned people go to Jamaica, they love it. Because Jamaicans, they want to, if you light skin, if you're a light-skinned black, they consider you practically white in Jamaica. And they're all up your ass. You know what I'm saying? But they don't like serving black people like that. I know a black Jamaican who he left Jamaica about 20 years ago. He grew up in Ocho's Rios. Dark skin, attractive man, like 6'6", like very attractive man. He told me he left Jamaica because he was told he was too dark to be a pilot in the military or in whatever pilot he was trying to become. They told him he was too dark. So he left and came to the U.S. and joined the U.S. military. Joined the Air Force or whatever. Um, I, I, I have an ex who is Jamaican and black American, dark skin. He was in Jamaica. He said they were throwing dark skin people out the club where he was at. You know what I'm saying? So this, and, and me being a black American and growing up, you know, in New York around all kinds of people and then staying the dancing, I've seen a lot of Africans and a lot of Caribbeans worshiping white people in a way that black Americans do not. We don't do that. Okay. And there's always been this conflict of, you know, certain black immigrants saying that black Americans exaggerate when it comes to the race issues. Oh, black Americans are exaggerating. Why are they complaining about they, they don't think. But on the flip side, and 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 on the flip side, if you come from Jamaica or African countries, the people who who did you wrong were black people. 
So a lot of them don't see the white man as the enemy because sometimes the white man saved them. My dad has a friend. I can't remember what African country she's from, but it was a country that was dealing with genocide. And a white woman, white people saved her up out of that situation. So you can't say nothing bad to her about white people. Because black people were the ones that were terrorizing her in her African country. Okay, and that's a valid perspective. And that's why it's also important to remember that just because they're your color, they're not your kind. You know, a lot of black Americans have this idealistic idea that every black person is, is, is their friend. And every black person has their best interest at heart. You know what I'm saying? And that's not, that's not the case. And we see it in a situation like Haiti. And I feel like Haiti will not get strong. People say free Haiti, but free Haiti for, from who? Haiti is not going to get stronger if everybody keeps running away. There were times in America where stuff was extremely uncomfortable. Okay? And there's still places. I mean, America's a huge country. There's some pitiful places in the United States. I mean, I'm in Chicago, which is beautiful, but Gary, Indiana, it looks like the end of the world. Youngstown, Ohio. Okay? East St. Louis. Okay? There's a lot of jacked up places in the United States. Okay? But you don't see all the people in East St. Louis saying, oh, my God, it's so horrible here. We have to flee to South America or to the Caribbean. No. You know, we don't flee in that way. And things aren't perfect here, but they got a lot better because we fought. And some of us are still fighting. And you have some black Americans who are being convinced they need to move to Africa, which is no, because this is not the white man's land. This is not Europe, okay? Europe and America, Europe is the white man's land. That's their land. You go to Europe, you're on their territory. America is not their land. America is not great because of white people. America is great because of the American Indians who are already here. Chicago. People say Chicago was founded by a Haitian, right? Uh, a Haitian man founded Chicago, DuSable, okay? But the roads in, in Chicago is like... Uh, the way the streets run in this city is the most confusing divine mathematics I've ever come across. And these are old Native American trails, okay? All these roads and the way that the roads run in Chicago and how intricately complicated it was, they got it from the Native Americans. So someone could say a Haitian founded the city, but there are people already here. It's like saying Columbus founded America or something when people were already here. So yes, but though a Haitian is responsible for the founding of, of Chicago, there were still indigenous people here already that had certain systems. And Chicago is a Native American name. Okay, that's an indigenous name. Chicago, Milwaukee, Mississippi, Tennessee, Iowa, you know, Massachusetts. Those are all indigenous names. Okay. Tallahassee, you know, um, um, a bunch of places, right? So the, 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 the reason why the land is so rich and certain things, we have the American Indians, Native Americans to thank for. Thank for that, okay? So this is not the white man's land. And, of course, they want to convince us that there's not that many of us, that a lot of us came from Africa when we've always been here because they want, to, they want us to leave, you know, so they can take over this shit. No, I'm not with black Americans fleeing, okay? I'm not ever going to flee my country, Okay. Every country has pros and cons. Every country has problems. I'll take America's problems over anybody else's problems. Okay? And your country will not get better when everybody is leaving. Like Haiti is even, you losing like 200,000 people a year. And then there are so many Haitians that are coming to America. So when people wonder why are other countries getting involved in Haiti's issues, why are other Caribbean islands voting on, because What's going on in Haiti is also affecting everybody else because you want to come to our countries. You want to go to Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic is poor as shit. I've been to Haiti and Dominican Republic. Jamaica is poor as shit, okay? All these places. But the Dominican Republic is already super poor. So it's like, how are they going to... And, 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 and Dominican Republic has the number one tourism industry in the Caribbean, but that money is not going to Dominicans, okay? So Dominicans can't take all the Haitians. No Caribbean island can take that, and America can't, okay? So it's in the best, it's in everybody's best interest that Haiti be able to, you know, get their, their stuff together so that Yah can stay in Haiti, okay? Because it puts burdens on other people as well, right? But I'm just all about, I'm not saying that, that, that of course, we know that Haiti has been raped, it's been taken advantage of, but I'm just saying that's the history a lot of places, 
And at the end of the day, when your own people are stealing and harming you, okay, like people need to be held accountable for that. And there's nothing good or nothing that makes sense about these gangs that are taking over Haiti. I don't see how anything can come, how anything good can come out of gangs taking over the country. Okay, these are not organized, you know. And and then then they're running around with all these guns and weapons and bragging about it, killing people. Um, uh, some people were saying, well, how how are they getting those guns? They have to be coming from America. Well, I saw on the news that they were coming from Miami. And to my understanding, just like a lot of African countries, if you pay the right money, you can bring whatever you want into the country. Okay, so imagine if Haitians in Miami are paying, you know, to bring these weapons into Haiti and the people that are running customs are turning a blind eye because they're getting money. So the sad truth and reality is too many Africans be easily bought. You can't be easily bought. The civil rights movement in America had problems with infiltration. It had problems with people who you thought was on your side, but they were really working for the ops. Okay. My dad was traumatized by that time to the point where he couldn't watch that movie. I forget that movie that was made about um, the movie that was made. What was the movie was made recently, like a couple years ago, about um, Fred Hampton and stuff. Um, my dad couldn't even watch it because he was traumatized by that. And his own his own experiences with Cohen Tell and all that. Okay, and somebody that that came, my dad did a speech once. He tells me a story about how he did a speech once, and. Um, this man came up to him after his speech and told him that he was sent to assassinate my dad because they thought my dad was the ops. But the man, after listening to my dad speak, said, there's no way that this man could be the ops. Okay, because back then my dad said they didn't know who was really for real. And it was a scary time. Okay, so yeah, they infiltrated that. Okay, there's always people that can be bought. But I feel like with African countries, it's really bad. It's like all people care about is money like they care about money, uh, uh, short-term money over their own people? Somebody said Turks and Caicos have more Haitians than locals living there. So do can like immigration affects countries? And isn't Turks and Caicos don't they speak Dutch? Unless I'm wrong, isn't that a Dutch colony? So it's like most people don't even speak Haitian Creole. Okay. A lot of Haitians don't speak French. They speak Creole. So what are we supposed to do with that? You know what I'm saying? Like, really, Haiti needs to be okay, and they need to stop fleeing. And for all the Haitians, all of the Haitians who keep saying that your life is so much better in Haiti, and it's not all of Haiti, I want to ask you why you are not in Haiti then. To so all of the Haitians that feel so strongly that about what Haiti needs, why are you not in Haiti? The civil, rights, the civil rights movement in America didn't happen from outside the country. It didn't happen from those who fled. It happened from those who were in the trenches. Many risked their lives. Blood was shed. Okay? It's easy to run away and talk about what people need. And to me, personally, I can't understand how Haiti can do it without outside intervention. I see that the president of El Salvador has said, he said he, said, he, said he could fix it. And I see uh, a lot of Haitians that are okay with that because they're like, he changed around El Salvador. El Salvador went from one of the most dangerous to one of the safest countries in the world. Same thing with Colombia. Okay, 20 years ago, my Colombian best friend told me, don't go to Colombia. Your life is worth nothing in Colombia. Like, it's not safe. The first time I went to Colombia was in 2018. Totally different country. They cleaned that country up. They cleaned it up. If people are really happy in their country, they don't flee by the masses. Like, you don't meet people from Costa Rica. You never really meet Costa Ricans. You might meet one or two in your whole life. Because Costa Ricans are happy. They're not over there scamming each other. They don't even have a military. But they're not scamming each other. They're not doing those things. They're not, they don't have gangs running around terrorizing the community. What are you doing that for? What are you doing that for? Haiti's most powerful man right now is a man named Barbecue. Street thugs running around gangs. They are gangs, okay? They don't all agree with each other. They're freeing prisoners. 
How, what, 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 why the hell would you go free prisoners? Some of the prisoners are too scared to leave. Okay, they themselves would rather just stay in a shut down prison than to even try to leave. Okay, people are burning up the streets. There are women who are getting raped. There are people who are getting um, unalived all the time. And then Barbecue says, if this prime minister doesn't step down, we, we're going to have a civil a civil war. What? Why? I'm, I don't even understand that. Why are you going to have a civil war? See, America had a civil war with a, with an with a objective, a very clear objective. You know, there was a very clear reason and a very clear outcome. And the civil war was the bloodiest war, okay? And it was the North and the South. You are a nation full of black people, very African. Haiti is very African. You guys are going to have a civil war about what? About what? And when I asked my friend Chris, he said, and neither side was the answer. That prime minister wasn't good, and these gangs ain't good. They're both bad. Neither one is the freaking answer. So what does Haiti do from there? What is Haiti going to do? Now they said that the prime minister stepped down. Okay, now you got not just one gang, but a bunch of gangs warring, a bunch of gangs stopping food, a bunch of gangs controlling the gas, kidnapping people. You're kidnapping your own people for ransom. I have seen stories of Haitian Americans going to Haiti to visit their family and they get kidnapped for ransom. What? Like, please make that make sense. And please tell me how the, what the white man has to do with that. Please tell me. Please explain. How can you blame France for that? How can you blame America for that? How? You're kidnapping your own people. You know, you got ransoms, controlling the gas, terrorizing. Like, if Haiti wasn't already, um, like, to me, a miserable place to live. Some people might not think that. Some people might think it's a great place to live. But to me, a miserable place to live. If it wasn't already like that, now you're making it worse for your own people. You're making it worse. And again, when I went to Haiti back in 2010, I said, if people want to help Haiti, and they want to come here and volunteer, somebody needs to come with some books and volunteer and teach them how to read. Because all the people that were sitting around, just staring in the space, could be reading and educating themselves. But it's a very non-educated island. Now, Haitian Americans, especially the ones in New York, are highly educated. All the Haitians in New York, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're very talented. They're good people. You know, Haitians aren't causing a problem in New York. They're, they're all very impressive people. So is that saying that Haiti's finest, the best of Haiti has left? So how is your country going to get better if everybody is leaving? And now who's left on the island but gangs? And a few people just didn't have the resources to get off that island. Like, what's the solution? Since, since Haitians don't want nobody to intervene, they're not happy with this, they're not happy with that, what's the solution? You think that your own people, because, I mean, there's a long decade's worth of history of corruption with your own people. So this goes back to when I went to Haiti in, in, in 2010 and I thought, you know, and they, they had pictures of white Jesus and they had pictures of Obama. And I'm like, the whole world, the whole black world loved Obama at that time. To me, you know, no, and no, no president, no leader is perfect, but people that think Obama is their enemy, you know, Obama's enemy of black people, especially the ones that love Trump. Like, that's another thing I don't understand. All the Haitians that were voting for Trump was crazy to me. I'm like, you think Trump cares about Haiti at all? You are really delusional. And you're blaming the Clintons for this and that? You think Trump cares more? That's what happens when people don't read. I don't know. Like, I just, well, the Haitians that voted for Trump are in America, so they weren't the Haitians on the island, but I'm just like, the logic behind that makes no sense. Then we saw the images in Texas a couple years ago where they were on the, the, the I don't know if it was Border Patrol, whoever it was, was on the horses like they it looked like slavery days okay you see haitians in the water and i don't know if the, if the the white people in texas had the whips but they were on the horses and it just looked, it just reminded us all the black americans they reminded us of slavery and you're voting for donald trump it's not it's just like make it make sense okay because donald trump he called all those countries should hold countries like and he doesn't care donald trump doesn't care about anybody okay Donald Trump cares about his money. He's somebody. That's why I think Donald Trump, 
more than anything is not a good leader and should not be because he could be bought. People that can be bought are scary. Donald Trump only cares about his money. Anything that's going to put money in his pocket, he's with it. I don't think he cares about his own kids. If his own kids go against him, he will get rid of them. Okay. Donald Trump is selfish and just cares about money. And people like that can be easily bought and are not good for leadership. And that is the issue with too many African countries. Okay. And I'm, I'm calling Haiti an African country, not because it's in Africa, but because most of the people in Haiti are African. Okay. Not all, but most. Okay. So anyhow, let me make sure I made all my points. Um, Oh, and some of the things, just, just a couple of differences about Haitian, you know, because slave society wasn't the same everywhere. Now, Haiti had one of the most brutal forms of slavery, okay? Slavery was brutal, which is one of the reasons why I'm so into black dance from the Americas and why I really believe in it. It's such a potent medicine is because um, the dances in the Americas, Haiti, Cuba, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, um, <laughs> New Orleans, it don't matter, right? These, Jamaica, um, they're all involved in tense hip movements and manipulation of the hips and shaking and gyrating. And there's medicine in that of shaking off trauma, resetting our energy fields. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's under-acknowledged medicine. It's something I feel strongly about, which is why I'm always dancing, no matter how much I get criticized for shaking and gyrating. I'm like, to me, that's self-hate because there's a lot of medicine and history in our dances, okay? And... Um, Haiti had their form of slavery was so brutal that the average slave didn't make it like a year I think that they would literally work to death North American slavery wasn't as harsh because there wasn't as many Africans there wasn't many, as many black people there wasn't as many slaves they didn't have a surplus so they knew if they work all their slaves to death they won't have any slaves Haiti was getting fresh imports constantly so they didn't care about working you to death. It was like, okay, next. It was cheaper just to work you to death and get a new one. That's how that's how slavery was in Haiti. But one of the differences, too, is that with Haiti, if you were born to a slave mom and a white dad, you were privileged. You were educated and you weren't enslaved. And whereas we know in America, you would still be a slave. If you if you were born to a slave, enslaved mom and a white dad, you'd still be a slave. Whereas that wasn't the case in Haiti. Which is why, like, you have the Haitian bourgeois who are light skin and live a very different life in Haiti. Okay. Um, the slaves in Haiti outnumbered the colonizers 10 to one. So that's one of the reasons why the Haitian revolution was so successful. It's the 10 to one. Okay. That's, they, uh, and that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why it's so successful. And then you have Haitian voodoo and you have the deals that people make with spirits. Okay. And whatever it is that they got to repay or give or, you know, I'm not an expert on that, but I know that's involved in any of these religions, which is why a lot of Haitians and Africans run from them. I only know one Nigerian, and I know a lot of Nigerians, a lot, okay? I only know one Nigerian who openly practices his Yoruba culture, his Yoruba religion. Every other African I know, very Christian, very Muslim, they don't want to hear nothing about that, even though they might go to... Uh, a bush doctor or something really pops off, they denounce that. They denounce it. I've seen black Americans practicing Yoruba religions in America who had a Nigerian landlord. And when the Nigerian landlord saw that they were doing that, they wanted to kick them out. Okay. When I went to Cuba, to Santiago de Cuba, with a Nigerian friend of mine who grew up in Nigeria, he was Yoruba, and we went to Santiago de Cuba and he said, he was in awe of what he saw because he saw the Cubans, they were in the street doing whole elaborate shows of or Orisha dances, which come from his people, the Yoruba. And he said they celebrate being African more than Africans. I remember he said that. He filmed the video and sent it back to his mom in Nigeria because he couldn't believe it because he's like, you would never see that in Nigeria. And, I, and like I said, I only know one Nigerian who openly, that's what he practices, that's what he does. Like he's not no Muslim, he's not a Christian, he's not... He's not praying to white Jesus. No. And a lot of Africans look at that like it's evil, it's wrong. 
over a decade ago, there was an African woman. She came from, her bloodline came from like three different countries or three different tribes or something. And she traveled through Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal. And she wanted me to come to, to these countries to teach what I was teaching to women in America. I was teaching a workshop called Sensual Strength Training. And um, she, well, she, but there was many components to what I taught. And part of it was talking about the spiritual side, the goddess. She told me, if you come here, she said, Africans know about goddesses, but they don't see it as a positive thing. It's pretty much negative to them. So if you come here and teach, don't talk about any of that. Just talk about the sexual benefits. She, she told me, she told me, especially with Senegal, because she told me, now I'm not saying this, this is an African woman who told me that Senegalese women like to study whatever they could to, to learn how to please men. Okay. And that like whatever's going to please a man or whatever they're going to, they want to know about it. So she said, when you come to Senegal, just talk about the sexual benefits. Don't talk about none of that other spiritual stuff. No goddesses, none of that. So it's like, I feel like a lot of Africans really, you know, they, they, they claim to be so against the colonizers, but they hold the ideas of the colonizers, even when the colonizers no longer think like that. A lot of Africans are holding on to the ideas of colonizers. Same thing with Jamaicans. Okay, all that homophobic stuff in Jamaica, that's not African. All the homophobic stuff in Ghana, that's not African. If you actually go look at the primary documents and the belief systems before colonialism, that's not how they thought and acted. That came from the colonizers. Now the colonizers are been there, done that, past that. They're not even on that no more. Europeans ain't even that uptight. But that's where it came from. When you are still stuck so hard to the white man's word, but you think you're so pro-black. Same thing is true with a lot of black Americans. Okay? So, yeah. Like, I'm just about thinking critically. And I just want to know, what's the answer for Haiti? If, Haitian, if Haiti's finest are leaving, the, city, the, the country is being run by gangs. They haven't had an, an election in like eight plus years. You know, corruption is rampant. They're terrorizing their own people, stealing from their own people, no infrastructure. How are you going to have an election with zero infrastructure? I mean, none. None. How are you going to send things? If you said you want to send, let's say you have family in Haiti, you want to send something to them in particular. It's not going to make it to them. People don't even really have addresses. This is like pure chaos. So with all that being said, and, and, and Haitians don't want, and even though I don't know, the Haitians in the island, I don't know if they feel the same way that Haitians do who are not in Haiti. I think some of the Haitians on the island do want intervention. Is El Salvador the answer? A lot of them don't want the Kenyan troops. I see Kenyans online saying that they can't even get shit right in Kenya. I don't know. I've never been to Kenya. Can't speak on that. I'm just seeing comments from people. Um, so, but a lot of Haitians don't want the Kenyan troops to come there. So you don't want the Kenyan troops. You don't want, on the one hand, people say they don't want America to help them, but then you all, you all want to run to America. So which one is it? Because America's helping you when you come in this country and you're getting free things. You're getting free houses. All these people coming through the southern border, it's not just Mexicans and South America and Central Americans. It's Chinese, it's Haitians, it's Africans, all kinds of hundreds of thousands of people are coming into this country illegally, getting free houses, free everything that Americans ourselves aren't getting. Americans ourselves are all about on the brink of homelessness, okay, because of how expensive this country is and people losing jobs and, and, and wages being dropped because, you know, with America, when it's other countries, people could talk about how immigration affects the country, right? But when it's America, it's, oh, no, America wouldn't be what it was if it wasn't for immigrants. And that, it, to me, is highly offensive. America wouldn't be what it, what, what it is if it wasn't for the American Indians who've been here who cultivated this land. The U.S. government is based off the Iroquois Confederacy. Okay, the U.S. government, which is which is well organized in layers and systems, which came from the indigenous people who are already here. They modeled it after the Iroquois Confederacy. There's beautiful land on, on in this country because of the people who've been cultivating it for generations. That's not the white man. Okay, so to to take the credit away from the people who've been here and say that and give all the credit to, to America being so great to immigrants is ridiculous. People saying America can't survive without immigrants. People saying, um, oh, Americans are lazy. They're doing jobs that Americans don't want to do. No, they're coming and they're undermining pay rates. We're not doing slave labor over here. We work for certain working we, we My mom's a union organizer, so I know a lot about this. We work to have, you know, uh, we fought to have certain kinds of working conditions. Certain types of pay, 40-hour work week, child labor laws, okay? We fought to put those in place. 
Now you have people coming to this country saying, I'll do it for less. I know truck drivers who said there might, there, there are loads, a, a local load that could have been $500 one week. Next week they, they're offering 200 for it because you have people coming to this country who are willing to work for pennies. And so when you start undermining our pay rates, now the rates get dropped for everybody because you're coming over here selling yourself short and then calling us lazy because we won't do it. That's highly offensive. And nobody's having a real conversation about these things. You know, nobody's having a real conversation. And America doesn't need another immigrant. I'm sorry, we don't. Now, I grew up around immigrants. I grew up around, and I grew up around people from other countries who I used to hear them as a kid. And these aren't Africans. These are Caribbeans. These are Dominicans, you know, who would, or, or other Spanish-speaking countries in Latin America. And they would talk about how their family thought that they were rich because they lived in the United States. And they would resent their family for thinking that because they'd be over here struggling. I've heard so many Caribbeans say when they were in the Caribbean, they had a maid. Black Americans don't have maids. Even a lot of black Americans with money don't have maids. But you're calling us lazy when having a maid is not the norm. But all the Caribbean people I know, oh, we had maids. They're coming from the super poor countries, but everybody had a maid. So Americans are lazy. Like, all that stuff is highly offensive. No country is going to get anywhere if corruption is running rampant the way it is, or un unchecked. And even talking about outside intervention, the Russians have intervened in American elections, okay? That election between Trump and, and Hillary. The Russians did all kinds of stuff. So did, people have intervened in, with American stuff too. Everybody's been colonized. Everybody's had, you know, people meddling in their affairs and their politics, whatever. Every country has some level of corruption. No country is perfect. But can your country get better? If you claim to love your country so much, because Americans be living in America, and we don't wave around an American flag as much as immigrant groups who left their country come to America and want to tell you all day, I'm from Haiti, I'm from Jamaica, but they don't be in them countries. Right? And I see nobody's prouder, nobody loves Haiti more than the Haitians who live in America or live outside of Haiti who want to claim they love Haiti so much, but... You've never been there. You haven't been there in a decade or more. You're not on the ground helping your people. You're running away. I love America, and I'm not running away. I don't care who becomes president. I don't care what happens. I'm not fleeing. And black Americans, we don't have a place to flee to. Caribbean people and other immigrants will come here, and they want to claim America, but if shit hits the fan, you're going to be out as well. So do you even care about America? You come here. A lot of people come here to get what they can take. They don't care what happens to America. I care about what happens to my country. I come from a family who fought in this country. I have family members that fought in every single war, starting with the Revolutionary War. Okay? This is my ancestral land, and I care. So I'm not going to just jump ship when shit gets tough. Nobody in my family ever did that. And shit was tough in this country for years. Okay? So that's what I want to say. And I want to say about visiting Haiti, there's a lot of people who will be trying to say the old sense exaggeration. I'm just going to say... It seems like nothing has gotten better since I was there in 2010. And when I was there in 2010, I was shocked at how bad it actually was. Okay? And to this day, I haven't been any place that bad. And so a lot of times people don't want to tell the truth. Either people, like, make something to seem way nicer than it is or they make it seem like it's way dangerous than it is. Like, Chicago is not a scary place. Most people think, oh, I come to Chicago, I'm going to get shot. It's so dangerous. Chicago is super peaceful. Okay? Now, I'm not going to say that the violence isn't real, but it's a big city. I've been here for seven years, never had an issue, never. It's just a peaceful freaking place. It's beautiful and it's peaceful. So that danger gets way blown out of control. But there's other places where it really is super dangerous and people are acting like, oh, it's not that bad. And Haiti is one of those places. My mic is off. Tell me, can you guys hear me? Somebody tell me my mic is off. It says it's on on my side. Can you guys hear me? 
oh you can hear now, okay.